All right, everyone. Thanks for your patience. We were waiting for a committee member, and uh, they're ready now. A little miscommunication there. Uh, thanks for hanging out. So for those of you who don't know me, my name is Felipe Barreto. I've been Dan's PhD advisor for the last few years, and I just wanted to give a few words. I'll keep it really brief so we can keep, get going. But uh, uh, Dan came came to us from uh, Northeastern University, Nova Southeastern University in um, Florida. Where they, have, they have a really good marine science, marine biology program, and he already had some really good experience working on marine inverts. So uh, he's going to have an acknowledgement, acknowledgement at the end, as usual. But I, I first wanted to thank Dan for not only being a great student, but also for taking a chance because he was the first student to apply for my lab, my lab research group. I didn't even have a research group. I was here for three months, and I got an email from this really fantastic student. I have no idea how he found me, um, but he but he applied. And, uh, you know, I got a call in January, a few months after the application from Dan. He's like, you know, I'm, I'm the guy who applied to your lab. I'm, I'm not right now in Portland uh, at a meeting. And I really wanted to come by and meet you in person, talk to folks over there. And it was Monday, first day of the quarter, and there was a snowstorm. And uh, do you, do you remember this, right? Yeah. And I talked to him. I was like, you know, I would love to meet you in person. But having come from San Diego, this looks horrible. Uh, but he's, he said, I'm from Wisconsin. I got it. And then he, he, made, he made it in record time. He made it in record time, met a bunch of people, did great in an interview. A few months later, he joined the lab. So Dan's been great. Uh, he also had some really uh, interesting and, and great uh, features that an advisor really likes, which is uh, motivation and, and determination to be kind of independent. So after in our first meeting uh, conference that we went to together after a year in the lab, he did what everyone should do, network, go to a lot of talks, Get new ideas. He came back with a project of his own. He did not rely on the, the, the grants that we had. Came up with new ideas that were kind of out of my comfort zone, but he, he formed a committee to help him through it. So I was really thankful for that. And it was a very, very fun to see your first student kind of take off in that way. So I was really, very happy with that. And he's going to present some of this. And uh, Dan has also been a really important part of the teaching team at OSU. He has uh, become, especially the anatomy group, I believe. And uh, at times, uh, I've tried to pay him out of teaching so he can focus on research, and I've never able to. They always beg to, for him to stay at the teaching uh, team. Uh, selfishly, I was very annoyed at that often, but it also speaks very highly uh, of Dan. And his teaching has gotten good enough that right now he, he has a job at uh, Spokane in Washington, where he's going to be teaching full time. Uh, so it's very, very exciting for them. So he's been a great member of the lab. Uh, Good time to see him go. It's time, uh, and, and but I'm, I'm excited to see everyone see finally what, what he's been doing. He's already published the first chapter of his dissertation, has manuscript from two other ones, published as an undergrad. He's he's uh, he's been doing a great job in marine marine sciences. So uh, let's let's get going. Dan. should be on now, so. Awesome, thanks again, Felipe, for the intro. Um, you kind of stole a lot of my like jokes and like stories from my acknowledgements when we got to you. I like had the exact same stories, so I'll have to revise that a little bit. Um, but today we're gonna talk a little bit about phenotypic and transcriptomic evolution of the circadian clock network in an intertidal crustacean. That's what the title says. So make sure I actually have this on. Before we talk about circadian clock networks, we need to take a step back and just think about photoperiods themselves. Photoperiods are essentially the amount of light in a given day. So as the earth is spinning about its axis, you get these periods of daytime and then periods of nighttime. Photoperiods themselves vary seasonally. So as the earth ro revolves around the sun with its axial tilt, you get different patterns of daylight in the summer. So think about back to those really nice days where you actually have the long summer days compared to now in the winter where you get these really short days and it kind of stinks. And we also see variation along latitudinal climbs. So in this little fun little graphic here, if you look at the amount of total day light in a given day around the equator, it's pretty consistent. It's typically always around 12 hours of day, no matter what time of year you're in. However, as you move away from the equator, go more polar, you start seeing a lot larger ranges or variation in photo periods. Um, I'll start referring to this as like their photo period regimes, where you can think, you know, 
right at the poles, you get entire days of only light and entire days of no light whatsoever. So there's a lot of variation. Um, that's really important for organismal life history. Um, the reason why is there's a lot of things in the environment that change. A lot of those change happen seasonally, but they don't happen super predictably, right? We know that temperatures change. We know that abundances of rainfall, other environmental conditions vary, but year to year, it's not super consistent. Daylight, however, extremely consistent. The amount of light that you'll see today is the exact same amount of daylight we'll have one year from now, one year ago, five years ago, a thousand years ago, 10,000 years ago. Very, 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 very consistent. This has allowed for organisms that want to maintain fitness, have behaviors and patterns and strategies that are well suited to these seasonal variations to develop strategies that are based on this photo period variation, both seasonally and within the day. So what kind of things am I talking about that they regulate or are kind of beholden to these patterns of photo periods? Well, you have daily and seasonal patterns of foraging activity. So what time of the year you're actually eating, if you're not eating maybe in the winter or having a large feeding season during the spring. This can also be daily, what time of day you're actually feeding. Do you eat at the morning when there's maybe no other predators around? Do you eat later at night when there's a lot of food that's available? This can also be mating. Do you mate at a specific time of the year? Think about like in spring when all the you know new baby animals come around. This can also be daily yet again. Some animals have specific times of day that they mate. I've always liked to joke about it. The early bird gets the worm, but the on-time bird actually gets laid. <laughs> More broadly, this can also be activity. So you can have seasonal patterns of how active you are. So during summer, you may be active for a lot longer periods than you are in the winter. This can be daily patterns of activity. Are you active in the morning? Are you active at night? Are you active throughout the day or specific times of the day? These are things that are all still controlled and regulated by the amount of daylight that we see. Um, if we were to step in a little bit more molecularly, look inside cells, a lot of genes and gene networks are regulated by these cycles of day. So this is just an example of metabolics. It's a very well-known thing that how metabolics are regulated can oscillate throughout the day. This can also include things like hormone regulation, and if I'm being honest, I could spend the rest of this dissertation time just talking about all the different things that are regulated. It's an incredibly important thing to biology. This is just but a small fraction of things that are importantly regulated. Um, to do this kind of patterns of how these organisms actually prepare and maintain rhythms throughout the day, we like to talk about the molecular mechanism, which is the circadian clock. Uh, it comes from the Latin circa die, or close to a day. Um, here's just a really simplified version of what this gene network is. It's a network of genes and the resulting proteins that have transcription and translational feedback loops that increase the expression of certain genes that are controlled by these rhythms that I've just talked about. And then they decrease them at other points in the day. And then those oscillations start again at a new time for the next day. To look at that, what I'm talking about here, you have some, and we're not going to worry about the specific names for right now, some positive element of the circadian clock that their resulting proteins tell other genes that are within this core mechanism to increase transcription as the day moves on. So more gene expression is happening. This is also controlling some downstream clock control genes, so not just the core mechanism that actually oscillates, but also those genes that regulate the behaviors that I've talked about. Then you also have a negative acting element. So as this positive acting element is increasing expression of these ones, the resulting proteins themselves can inhibit their own inevitable expression. So when you look at the gene expression of that throughout the day, that positive element was kind of increasing expression. And now we're kind of oscillating back down. This mechanism is endogenous. So what I'm saying, or what I refer to when I talk about this is, while this is gonna be in context of light, when we kind of keep going with this, 
it does not actually need light for these oscillations to happen. They will just happen naturally in the system, roughly on a 24 hour period. That's where you get the circadian part of it. However, these can be entrained or synchronized to daylight, to patterns of photo periods by photosensitive genes. So a gene that as light hits it or light hits an organism, they perceive the change. These cells or these genes and proteins get activated by light. They cause destabiliz destabilization of some of these other elements. And what that ends up doing is preventing them from inhibiting the positive acting elements, which starts a new cycle in sync with whenever that light is starting. So it makes sure that you have these patterns all synced up to each day. Again, I've really simplified what this clock looks like. Um, in reality, the circadian clock itself is a much more complex set of genes. I've only just kind of briefly touched on some of these pink genes and this yellow gene here. In reality, there's way many, way more genes that actually exist. And that's just of the core mechanism itself that's oscillating. <clears throat> like I said, a lot of behaviors are controlled and regulated by the clock. Those behaviors themselves are regulated by their own set of genes, um, their own set of proteins. We like to think of those, or at least describe them as clock control genes. So genes that are beholden to the rhythms of the circadian clock. These can be genes that are found in specific tissues. So you can have specific rhythms for digestive systems, for neural systems, for cardiovascular systems. And if you were to look at genes that are then controlled by this circadian clock, you would still see similar patterns of oscillation where they are synchronized or affected by these patterns of daylight. So when it comes to the actual research that is known on circadian clocks, there's been a ton of great work characterizing what genes make up this molecular mechanism. You know, what are their actual names? What protein-protein interactions do they have? What effects does that cause for oscillatory mechanisms? A lot of studies have also characterized what those behaviors actually were. So thinking back to that slide I showed with all the pretty little images, we have a lot of data that says this thing's controlled by circadian clocks. This behavior regulates by circadian clocks, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. A ton of really great stuff that identifies that. We also have it in a lot of different systems. Many of these systems are terrestrial and run basically the gamut of most taxa of life. Um, there's studies on bacteria that show circadian rhythms, great work that's done in Arabidopsis that shows circadian rhythms. Uh, Drosophila is where I cited like half of my papers because there's almost too much information sometimes it feels like to uh, understand it all. There's a lot of insert, or information on like vertebrates like mouse. We have a ton of stuff on all these nice kind of vertebrate terrestrial stuff, invertebrate terrestrials. If I was to sum it up, I'd say the field itself is pretty good on molecular mechanisms right now. It's pretty good on what rhythms are controlled seasonally and daily. We have a great understanding of what kind of things we can expect. And we have a lot of really good data on a lot of terrestrial species. Um, hopefully I've primed you then to think, well, what don't we have? We don't have that many great stuff on marine systems. So that's not to say that there isn't any, we have, some really cool work that's been recently coming out on Calanus copepods. There's been some studies published on nematostel and cnidarians, and a couple of studies done on crassoterran oysters. But a lot of these studies are limited in their scope. This is a field that hasn't seen nearly as much research as the previous one. So a lot of it is this early characterization of what kind of rhythms do exist? Um, do these systems actually have circadian clocks? Do they actually have rhythmic behaviors? But that's basically it for right now. Very, very small comparatively. <clears throat> I'll take a drink for one second. The other thing that I feel is at least limited in the research currently is oftentimes these studies that look at circadian clocks typically look at populations that are either fairly widespread in their distribution, or they only really look at one species without thinking about the actual population dynamics of a species. So if you think back to this image here that I showed you, 
depending on where you live, you experience very different photo periods potentially, or have very different photo period regimes. Something that lives down here has to be able to adjust behaviors to a really long day and a very short day. I timed that perfectly. Population over here, they really only have to worry about that 12 hours. But in reality, population structures are more complex than that. Populations have different distributions. Some populations don't disperse very well across different areas, so you get isolated populations. So what we don't have is a lot of knowledge on how do independent populations, how have they evolved the strategies to do all those rhythms that I've discussed in specific photo period regimes that may be independent of another one. This is especially true for these latitudinally distributed populations that have these different regimes. So think about that again. We got a lot of great stuff, but we don't have a lot of info on these latitudinally isolated populations. They may have to think and or develop unique behaviors to their photo periods to entrain them to different conditions that a single population or single species may not. And we don't have a lot of information on marine systems. So after that meeting that I had that Felipe alluded to, I kind of came away asking, well, what are consequences of evolving under different photo periods for isolated populations? <clears throat> And with that in mind, I want to set out to address three main topics or three main questions. These will be each of my three chapters. First, have geographic differences in day length resulted in phenotypic divergence? So are these isolated populations developing unique phenotypes from living in these isolated photoperiod regimes? How are those clock genes and their downstream clock control genes then actually expressed? And then lastly, this will make a lot more sense when we get to it, but under the context of this one too, do these divergent populations evolve variation in gene splicing? Basically, is there some other alternative regulatory mechanism that maybe helps contribute to some of these that isn't seen yet in just looking at these first two chapters? To do this, we use Tigriopus californicus. This is the tide pool copepod or the intertidal copepod pictured here. They themselves are a latitudinally distributed population. Find them from Baja, Mexico up into Alaska. They themselves live in the high intertidal. So this is, when I say high intertidal, this is beyond the point where there's consistent inundation of water. So we like to say, go down to the tide pools, go find all the really interesting, cool organisms, then turn around 180 degrees, walk back towards the parking lot. You'll find a scummy little pool way far away from everything, and they'll just be chock full of these little tiny copepods. But as a result of them being so far away, there's so little inundation of water that all the tide pools that do form end up creating these very genetically distinct isolated populations all along the coast. So that satisfies that nice, what happens to isolated populations? They're a marine system. Got those two little X's kind of marked off. As a study system themselves, they're super easy to culture. Just take like a jar, scoop them up, take them back to the lab. We can keep them in nice incubators where we can control temperature, photo periods, how much food they're actually getting, the salinity of all their water. Pretty easy to keep them alive. Sometimes it's really hard to kill them, despite our best efforts. Um, they're also really small. They're only like about a millimeter in size when they're fully grown. So you can keep an absolute ton of them and not have to worry about limited sample sizes. They have quick generation times. It's about a month to go from tiny little larva or nopula into an adult that's already able to produce and make new offspring. Um, since we have all this data or have all these copepods, there's a lot of other collaborative labs that do work on this system. We have a lot of genomic tools as well. So we have nice reference transcriptomes, genomes that we can ask really interesting uh, genetic questions, genetic expression for each of these independent populations. So with that, we're gonna jump into that first chapter of mine. This is the one that is currently published in the biological bulletin. Feel free to cite it to boost my H index score, which is apparently something people care about. <laughs> 
So have geographic differences in day length resulted in phenotypic divergence? To do this, I set out to look at two different populations that were latitudinally separated by about 15 degrees in latitude, one from Oregon, one from California. Just for the background, thinking about those latitudinal variations in photo periods, if you were to plot their photo period throughout the year, so each day, how many hours of daylight they get, you would get something that looks like this. You can see that there is a nice overlap in photo periods that they both experience, right? Around 12 hours of day, they both see that exact photo period. But this Oregon population way up here has these periods where they live in a photo period, kind of highlighted by these boxes, that that Californian population will never experience has never experienced, has never had to evolve under, has never had to develop any kind of behaviors or strategies consistent with this photo period. They don't disperse there, so it's a pretty reasonable thing to say. They do not experience that. With that, we want to think, well, how do these phenotypes differ in a condition that they both experience versus then one that only one of them experiences? So, we set two different photo period conditions, one a 12 hour day, 12 hours a night that they both experience. Then we did the eight hours of day and about 16 hours a night, which is not experienced by the Californian population, but it's a close approximation of something that the Oregon population would experience. And we designed a common garden experiment around that. For some phenotypic traits, we wanted to look at growth rate. So how fast they went from their larval stage to their copepidid stage, so a nice little metamorphosis happening. And we also wanted to look at their overall adult body size. So two growth factors that are known to be controlled and regulated by photo periods. So do they change in those sizes? We also wanted to do a little bit of preliminary look at some of those clock genes themselves. So we designed a qPCR experiment around both of those days. So here you're just seeing the day kind of as like a nice circle where you see this dashed line here is where the day ends for an eight hour population or a population that's in the eight hour condition, 12 hours dark period. So we wanted to just sample copepods around a couple of those time points. So right when the day subjectively starts, this is gonna be referred to as the Zeitgeber time of zero. Zeitgeber just means like time giver. So subjective day starting, subjective day ending in the eight hour populations, 12 hour populations. And then we also selected one time point in the middle of the day, just to see how gene expression was changing during a photo, during a photic time point. So from that, we wanted to just look at some basic expressions, gene expressions, see if there was any differences we could see. Maybe they had shared responses. Maybe they had divergent responses in expression that could be really interesting. To start with that growth rate, so going from larval stage into a copepidid stage, when we looked at the 12 hour photo periods across both of our populations, we noticed that Oregon was growing quicker. So these letters here just in indicate significant values or significant difference in groups. <clears throat> that Oregon population was undergoing metamorphosis a couple of days faster than in that Californian population. When we compared that then to the eight hour photo periods, we saw a similar result where, again, the Californian population grew slower, so underwent metamorphosis at a later time than our Oregon population. One other thing that was really interesting about this is you'll notice that Oregon population was always quicker than the Californian population, no matter the condition. Even the faster Californian ones were still slower than what was averagely seen in the Oregon population. The other thing that we thought was really interesting, if you look at kind of this variation of each of these dots, these dots represent kind of each of our samples. There were 48 per trial per condition. So 48, 48, 48, 48. If you look at the variation and spread of the data, California had a lot of variation through both of their conditions. Oregon had some variation in this one, but when we switched to this eight hour photo period and looked at them, 
there was effectively no variation. I plotted this with jitter so it was just easier to see the data points. In reality, there was only like two groups or two copepods that did not all metamorphose at this same time. An incredibly coordinated response that is just not seen in any of the other conditions. And we had to redo this for the reviewers. They didn't believe that further. Like, oh, maybe, you know, try this again, see some other things. And same exact thing. We were kind of like, oh, wow, that is pretty cool. <laughs> ha, take that reviewer too. He made me do other reviews. It's fine. When we looked at total body size, so we didn't look at just how long they grew. We waited until they reached their full adult body size. We looked at only adult males so we could control for sex differences. In that 12 hour photo period, they grew to about the same size though. So even though the organ population typically is growing faster, they ultimately reached the same body size. When we changed photo periods again, both populations saw a shared response in that their total adult growth or total adult body size was smaller than in the 12 hour day. However, these were not significant across groups. So. Previously, we saw differences in growth rates across populations. Here, it's only across photo periods. So there's potentially some interesting trade-off that's going on between growth rates and total body sizes that are cool to be explored. Looking at gene expression, we do see patterns of divergence. So just to kind of clue us in on what we're looking at here, this is time of the day. This start here would be that time zero, so the beginning of their subjective day. This first dashed line would be when the eight hour day concludes. So it becomes the dark cycle, solid line when the 12 hour day concludes. Still colored by their populations, dashed lines just to indicate expression for the copepods that were raised in the eight hour, solid lines for the 12 hour. We saw divergence in expression of certain clock genes. So in this example, for some of these ones, we're not gonna get into the actual genes themselves for right now again just kind of show what these broad patterns are. We saw increases of expression in the Californian population compared to the Oregon population, so a larger amplitude. Another one where we saw a nice larger amplitude. We also saw this one, a really cool kind of case of divergence. This gene timeout is a duplication of this gene. Um, and there's, we weren't sure at the time, we didn't have evidence to say which one was the one that was maybe functioning as a circadian gene. Um, it's most likely this one, but even if this wasn't a clock gene itself, just a duplication doing something else, there was still a very clear difference due to photo period. In the 12 hour day, they both had fairly similar expression profiles, but when you switch to an eight hour day, the Oregon population saw an increase in expression, but the Californian population saw an overall decrease in expression. So they kind of went the opposite way. It wasn't all divergence though. We did see some shared responses in gene expression. So the 12 hour day for this gene, all kind of down here, this is all again, relative expression. So if you see, for example, I'll just skip to this one, relative expression around one for both of these populations in the 12 hour day. When you switch over to the eight hour day, you're basically seeing a three and a half to four times increase in expression of this gene consistently across the day. But they both did that and they both did it in kind of nice shared pattern. So not everything's divergent. We expect shared things to exist. But if we were to ask that question again, with the context of what my results are, are there divergence or different patterns? Well, yeah, there is a difference in growth rate. Oregon was always a faster grower. <clears throat> and certain genes did behave different under different photo periods. However, there are also plastic responses. Can't have the perfect story where everything's different. <clears throat> and we did also see shared behaviors or shared changes in growth in total body size across both of those populations as well. So we have some cool phenotypes that are different. To me, that warranted further exploration, right? If you have something cool, keep going with it. So <clears throat> with that cool phenotype in mind, next step is, how are these clock genes expressed in populations then that have evolved under these different photo periods? If these genes are what is regulating behaviors and different phenotypes that we see, what does that actually look like? So just to again reiterate, 
There's the circadian clock itself, the network of genes that are oscillating, controlling all these behaviors. They affect all of these downstream clock controlled genes. These clock controlled genes can have very specific functions. And if you're to look at their expression throughout the day, genes that you would expect to be clock controlled would have an expression profile, something like this, that nice little oscillatory wave, one that isn't clock controlled, so a gene that doesn't really care about what the photo period is, would just have its own kind of pattern. It may look something like this, could be a flat line, could be just a straight increasing line, could be only increasing under certain conditions, something like that. So when we wanna look at genes, we can think if they're clock controlled and they are beholden to the clock, we can maybe look to see if they have these kinds of patterns. <clears throat> and again, if we saw, saw things with growth rates, things that affect growths are oftentimes like metabolic pathways. So if we see differences in populations growth sizes, maybe we'll see differences in metabolic pathways and we'll see some cool information that looks similar to what I just showed you there. <clears throat> Not only can we test to see whether a gene is rhythmic or not rhythmic, we can also think about what that temporal organization looks like. So if you look at one gene in two different populations and compare its expression profiles, do they look exactly the same? Which means these genes are being regulated in the exact same manner or similar fashion. They're saying, hey, always increase expression here and then decrease here and then reset it there. So a nice synchronized pattern or across populations, do you maybe see an offset in expression? So maybe in one population, this gene's expression peaks at this time of the day, but in another population, it peaks here. And that can tell us, or at least suggest to us that these populations are evolving different strategies in response to a same photo period. So we're gonna go back to our fun two populations again. This time we're gonna only expose them to an eight hour photo period. We did this because we wanted to look at that photo period that was only found in one population or was only experienced by one population to see if we could tease apart some of those differences. <clears throat> From there, we wanted to design an RNA-seq experiment. So looking at kind of the whole transcriptome that we have, seeing what all these genes are doing, what their patterns are looking like. To do this, we took adult males. So again, we could control for age and sex. So we didn't have to worry about any of those kind of variables. And then what I did for two days, every four hours, I took groups of these adult males, crushed them up so I could sequence them. We did this on an Illumina high seq platform. And we ultimately looked at 15,000 genes for those rhythmicities. <clears throat> In reality, I had to do this twice because the first time I do it, did it, it failed. I locked myself out of the office at midnight. Friend came, got pulled over for speeding. Wouldn't recommend doing this again, or at least having more people do this. That's how I'd recommend it. But from all this data, we wanted to get a few things. What genes were actually being rhythmic in both populations, what those comparisons look like, what functions we could find that are associated with genes. So. Are they things like that are metabolics or are these populations doing two completely separate things? And then lastly, we want to look at that temporal organization. So if they did share some genes, were they being regulated in the same way or are they being regulated different temporal times, which could say that they have evolved kind of these unique strategies to a photo period. To get right to that first result, we actually found surprising little overlap compared to what you know, maybe we initially predicted. So in total of those 15,000 genes, and I'm not gonna just go slide by slide for each 15,000 of them, summarize it here. About 1300 genes were found to be rhythmic across both populations. However, only 95 of those genes were actually shared between populations. That's not incredibly surprising when we think about how we designed our experiment. We did full tissue sampling. And when you sample for full tissues, you sometimes lose a lot of resolution on like the tissue specific rhythms of certain clock control genes just because they can be dampened. And there's a lot of other reasons that happen that we can just move on for at least right now. But very few genes that were shared. When we looked at those 95 genes for what their functions were, so at least of these shared genes, 
what are what do they have in common? We found a lot of things. This is done using a gene ontology enrichment analysis. So we look at the genes that we found that were significant, look for terms that have been experimentally tested to see that they are associated with these functions, compare them to the rest of the gene universe, and whichever terms are overly abundant compared to the rest of the genes are the ones that you can think of as being significantly enriched or at least disproportionately important for those genes. Most of the processes and functions that we found, just to summarize this kind of complicated table with a lot of crazy words, are related to metabolics. Things like cat catabolism, <clears throat> biosynthetic processes, a lot of these relate to building up molecules, preparing things for metabolic functions, et cetera. So that's a good result. It says, okay, yeah, both populations regulate metabolics, probably expected should be expected. When we then looked at those genes that weren't shared, so those big differences, in the Californian population, we saw a lot of those were still associated with a lot of metabolic functions, things like small, meta, small molecule metabolics, oxidation reduction processes, basal lateral membrane processes. These are things that are associated with metabolism. However, in our organ population, we didn't see it all just be metabolism again. Instead, we saw a lot of different uh, terms that were associated with things like immune function, so T cell receptor singling, um, this NIK, NF, kappa beta signaling, uh, tumor necrosis factoring. These are things that are associated with immune function. Um, we don't think that there is any reason to think that this is because our copepods were sick, how we keep them in stock conditions and laboratory conditions. Um, they all use the same type of water. They all are kept in lab condition for a long enough period that any um, diseases that were present probably would have already gotten to them and affected them. So with fairly strong confidence, we'd say this is something that came out from the actual experiment itself. So differences in functions, that's the big takeaway. When we want to look at that temporal organization, so are they rhythmic in the same way or do they have that kind of fun offset that I'm not able to point out, but it's right over there. What we wanted to look at was the phase of them, the phase being where that expression peaks. So what I did was I plotted this as a radial histogram, kind of like that experimental design where hour zero, when the light turns on, hour eight, when the light turns off, and then plotted just the histogram of where we found phases. So of those 95 shared genes in that Californian population, most of them were peaking at about hour six with another group that was peaking at around hours 20 to 22. In, Cal or in our organ population, they also peaked at around hour six, but instead of having this nice peak here, you see it shifted a few hours to that hour 18. So even those shared genes that are both metabolic regu regulated are not oscillating in the same fashion. That can suggest to us that, hey, Maybe there are some behavioral differences going on, how they regulate these clock controlled genes. When we expanded this to all those unique genes, we saw basically the exact same pattern. So California still had peaks around six and that late night, Oregon still at six and hour 18, pretty consistent. So kind of nice to see that that was kind of maintained. Um, but we did want to see what what so you know what is actually shared from this. It can't all be different. If it's all different, something's weird. And we found from those 95 genes that were shared between them, only 17 of them actually had the exact same phase. Kind of spread out like this, mostly around that subjective dusk period, so when light is coming to a close. 17 genes that we found. But what was really cool was of those 17 genes. That's where we found most of the significant circadian clock genes themselves. So the genes that are canonically supposed to be oscillating in a system that has circadian clocks. Again, I'm not gonna go through what the name of these genes and their specific functions are for right now. Just trust me, these are well-known clock genes. They had the same phase. So we have clock control genes that are different but the actual circadian clock itself, at least temporally, across these two populations is being regulated similarly. Um, just as an aside, 
We did also want to look at what the genes that were the most offset were. So genes that in one population, it peaks like at the beginning of the day, the other population like 12 hours away. These are just representative plots for what that would look like. They were associated with things like ubiquitin and ATP binding. These are things that help regulate protein stability that are well known to be a part of the circadian clock itself. Um, just pretty cool, interesting things that we thought that we just wanted to throw out there. And there's 29 of those genes that were in those categories. But I wanna get back to what that central question for this chapter was. How are clock and there's downstream clock control genes expressed? Well, circadian clock genes, so those core mechanisms were largely similar and synchronous in expression. Pretty cool. However, clock control genes were really different. So main stuff similar, downstream not similar. And that was both in patterns, so how they oscillated, and what functions were associated with them. And when I got those results, um, it took me a lot of time to figure out, like, what did this really mean? What, why do I see this? How can core components of the circadian clock that control all these dang rhythms be similar, yet the thing they affect be different? That's not how it's supposed to work. Why? Is there some mechanism that allows for the phenotypic diversity that we see despite the similarities in this? And that's where I get to that last question. Makes a little bit more sense, hopefully. Have these divergent populations evolved variation in mRNA splicing? So have those genes themselves done some other regulatory mechanism that allows for that phenotypic diversity that I keep finding? Just to talk about what mRNA splicing is or alternative splicing as I'll keep talking about it. You have some representative gene. It has these coding regions, these exons that are in these nice little boxes with non-coding regions in between them. In mRNA splicing, a spliceosome, a complex of proteins, can selectively remove which exons to include in its mature finalized isoform. So in this case, you could have a splice variant that includes the red, the yellow, and the blue exons, or in another variant has the red, the green, and the blue <clears throat> that are different from each other. It's the same gene producing functionally different isoforms from each other. And what that means when you get to translation is you can end up getting different proteins from the same gene. Those different proteins may confer some biological difference may cause some phenotypic change. When genes go through this whole process, that whole central dogma of biology, it's not like you only ever need to produce just one isoform or the other. Oftentimes in some kind of you know, hypothetical condition, you can produce a large set of one isoform and a smaller set of another one and they may have some biological relevance for whatever that condition is. However, whatever those changes in isoforms confer, if you put them in a separate condition, you may see a switch in which isoforms end up being created by the spliceosome. So where you had a large abundance of this one with the yellow exon, maybe in this separate condition now, you see a lot less of the yellow one, but way more of the one that includes the green. And we're going to call this isoform switching. So is alternative splicing because of some condition change causing changes in isoforms, which may cause some phenotypic change down the line. <clears throat> so surprisingly, we took an organ in the California population. We went back to that first good experiment where we used a 12 hour day and an eight hour day, one where they both experienced the photo period, one where they only had one population that experienced the photo period. And we wanted to look at alternative splicing. So for that, <clears throat> we only sampled at one time point, just to keep the statistical analysis a little bit more wrangled. So I wasn't trying to look at every four hours, was there splicing within every four hours? We wanted to kind of say, is there just basic understanding of the isoform structure, isoform landscape in these populations. So we looked at only one time period that was in the 
relative daytime for both photic conditions. We designed a paired end RNA seq experiment. This paired end allows us to see differences in isoform structures that um, other versions that my like earlier chapter could not address. We wanted to test for different isoform usage. So were they doing these isoform switching as we like changed photo periods? <clears throat> and again, we also wanted to keep using these evenly aged adult males. So we didn't have to worry about any sex specific factors or age specific factors. The comparisons we wanted to make were population specific patterns of alternative splicing. So does the Oregon population use one exon or one isoform way more than the Californian population, independent of whatever that photo period changes are? Are there just photo period specific patterns? So if you looked at both copepod populations as just one giant, giant amalgamation, do they both just, when photo periods switch, do some kind of isoform switching? And then lastly, kind of synthesizing both of them, are there any population by light specific patterns? So is the Oregon population switching isoforms when we switch photo periods that is different than the Californian population specifically switching isoforms when you switch photo periods? The kind of data that we wanted to look at, again, includes what kind of genes can we actually find that are associated with isoform switching? What's that overlap look like? What are those functions, again, associated with them? And we could start thinking about what, how many isoforms are actually being made. What do those isoforms actually look like? Just to get an idea of it. So looking at our fun Venn diagram again, what we found was by far the biggest contribution of alternative splicing landscape for this experiment was just between population. So that was looking at the Oregon population just versus the California population did not care about what photo period condition was going on. Roughly 2,500 genes in that group. When we looked at just photo periods, so them as one population, switch that, see what happens. We only found two genes, which um, considering their population structure, consider these are very isolated populations, it may not be surprising that they don't behave the same because they are fairly different populations. And then lastly, when we looked at those population by light conditions, we found roughly 100 genes exhibited alternative splicing or isoform switching in the southern and roughly like 160 in that northern population. So slightly more in the northern. <clears throat> to look at each of these three major groups, we're just gonna kind of stop talking about between photo periods because there's only two genes there. So you can't do much statistical analysis on that. When we did that same kind of enrichment for ontologies, see what kind of functions we could find. Between populations, most of the terms we saw were associated with things like titan binding, uh, P granules, which are also referred to as like germline granules and the cytosol. These terms typically have associations with just proteins within the cytoplasm, um, structure and regulation of them. Alternative splicing is protein regulation as, or should sorry, I should say, alternative splicing is regulation of all these genes creating different proteins. So it's not incredibly surprising that maybe terms that are associated with things that happen in proteins in the cytosol would pop up. When we looked at the South population, we saw a lot of terms associated with Glycerol kinase activity. This can be associated again with metabolics. And in the northern population, I'm not going to read this full name out for you. It's a long one. Glycoprotein, though, similar in that it does stuff with glycogen or glycoproteins, can help with like some metabolic functions as well. However, we did also see, I thought this one was really interesting, proteolysis. This is the degradation or destruction of proteins. Um, circadian clock, if you think back to that mechanism I showed you, a lot of it is selectively breaking down those proteins at specific times of the day in order to regulate different things. This being a term that's kind of overly enriched may suggest that that northern population is doing a lot of protein regulation that switches as we switch photo periods, which could be really cool. <laughs> So 
So I just want to look a little bit at some of those isoform structures because I made a lot of these plots and I want to show them to you because I deserve that. We're not going to worry too hard about what these different isoforms actually look like. What you're seeing here is just for a representative gene that was found in both populations. So if we went back to that Venn diagram, this GLPK gene, this is a glycerol kinase gene, was found as to be significantly switching in both populations under photoperiod conditions. These gray parts here, this is just showing what that isoform structure looks like. So these are the parts that are retained versus these thin black parts are the parts that aren't from the total gene sequence that weren't a part of that actual isoform. And then on the right, we have isoform fraction. So how much of this isoform contributed to the total amount of gene expression for this gene under each of these conditions? Um, in the solid line or solid boxes, you have the copepods that were kept in 12 hour conditions. The white boxes are those for the eight hour one. <clears throat> what we saw here for this example, this is a shared response. In both populations, that top gene, that first isoform, was more prevalent in the 12 hour day. And then when you switch over to an eight hour day, you have the shorter one much more abundant in that condition. So cool shared response. Again, not everything is super different, divergent. We do see examples of shared things. Another gene that was found to be shared in between both populations can also show us divergent responses. So what does this actually look like? Well, this is just looking at the Oregon versus Californian population. We're not caring about photo period right now. We see these significant differences in which isoforms are actually being used. This first isoform up here was basically only found or more greatly found in the Oregon population, very little bit found in the Californian population. Conversely though, the second isoform was almost always found much greater abundance in the Californian population, but not really in the Oregon population. So there's some switch in isoform usage just across populations for this gene. <laughs> this gene for the sake of it, UCK2, is a uridine cytosine kinase, which is associated with pyrimidine synthesis and metabolics for this. We're not gonna worry too much about all those functional consequences for right now, just because it would take a little too much time. So those were genes that weren't a part of the clock. We did still wanna think about, well, what about those clock genes themselves? Those that were similarly oscillating, but maybe we have different you know, phenotypes still. Well, we did see um, alternative splicing and isoform switching in the circadian clock. And this gene, Clockwork Orange, probably one of our favorite ones just because of the name. We do see these patterns where this top isoform was always used less than it was used in the other population. However, that top isoform was used more in the Californian population, while the bottom one was used more comparatively in the Oregon population. Another gene, Timeless, I've shown this one for some of those other oscillatory plots, also saw differences in isoform usage. This small isoform here was basically found only very rarely in the Oregon population, but way more abundance in that Californian population. And this is a gene that has shown evidence for photoperiod specific splicing in uh, Drosophila montana, a uh, related Drosophila species to Drosophila melanogaster, if you're aware of that one. So some interesting stuff there. Could be some cool evidence that maybe this is a gene that's important for regulating differences in the clock functions that we see. But since I'm kind of coming up to time here, have divergent populations of all variation in splicing? Yep, we did see patterns. Did see different genes, make it nice and simple for you. There were population and photo period specific patterns of splicing in those genes. The clock itself shows these patterns. That may be helping explain why we see some of those phenotypes that were different across them. And that gets me to my ultimate conclusions. We're almost there, you guys. Sum it all up. Have geographic differences in daylight resulted in phenotypic divergence? Well, yeah, we did see that. We saw differences in growth rate. We did see some shared responses though. <laughs> we 
what did those patterns of gene expression look like? Well, the clock itself was pretty similar, but clock control genes were very different. That has a lot of really cool implications for these life history traits. And then, yes, there is mRNA splicing. Things are different there. That could help contribute to all these variations that we see, all this awesome stuff. So I wanted to sum this up in one sentence because they always tell you to do an elevator pitch, but I hate talking in elevators, so I'd rather do it in one. Um, every single evolutionary biologist who's ever taken a class, I assume anyone who's taken Felipe's evolution class, probably even Molly's genetics course, has heard at least this phrase from Theodosia Stepchansky, nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. My version of this one, almost nothing in biology makes sense without the light. Light's important. It helps kind of keep all of these rhythms in set. And with that, I get to my acknowledgments. Thank you. This took me a lot of time to create, mm -hmm. clearly by the high evidence of artistic, artistic rigor. <laughs> so acknowledgments. Um, my committee, I want to thank you guys all for all the work that you've put in, helping me, providing amazing feedback. Um, being incredibly quick to respond to a lot of emails, a lot better than I am at sending them. Um, thank you so much. Uh, Felipe, you put up with a lot of my nonsense for a lot longer than you're supposed to. I was supposed to be gone probably like years ago, but you stuck with me. You know, you said you I took a gamble going to you. You also took a gamble choosing me. You know, I was just this random kid from Wisconsin who was living in Florida. It's like, hey, I did a random Google search and found you. Can I join your lab? And you said, yeah, sure. Whether or not that was smart on your end, who knows? But you put up with a lot. You've been an amazing advisor. Um, I'm going to miss all the times that you've cooked really wonderful food for us as well. Um, still not sure if I've like accustomed to chicken hearts yet. That's probably still a pass for me. But you know, I appreciate that you put the effort to do that. Um, my secondary advisors, as I call them, um, you know, it's no secret. I really enjoy teaching. I got a job teaching anatomy and it's no short part to Lindsay and Devin. Um, you know, I came in teaching anatomy thinking like, well, this sucks. I'm a, I'm a marine biologist. Dang it. I like crustaceans. I hate humans. I don't like talking to people. And they made it a lot easier for me. And I ended up realizing I actually really like teaching. Maybe it's because I like hearing my own voice. Maybe it's because you guys inspired me. I like to think mostly it's the latter. Um, the current lab members, you guys have been awesome. Um, I hope I've set somewhat of a decent example as the first grad student, who knows? But you guys have always been really great. I've enjoyed all the times we've gone to hang out together and do everything. Um, all my friends that I've made along the way, um, if you're not on here and you wanted to be on here, it's because I didn't have a picture of you and I only made this in like an hour part, so I didn't take too much time but if you're my friend you know it but you all were great all the game nights that we've done all the times we've hang out all that awesome stuff it's you know it made living through all this a lot easier it made my time super great i wouldn't trade you guys for anything my family um you guys have also been great they're watching this via remotely because i told them please don't show up to these things because it's easier that way but it's not because I don't love them. I love them very much. Um, you know, it was my family a lot of times that inspired me to become a scientist, to um, do all the things that I wanted. Me being better than them just helped as well. You know, set up that great example. Again, I kid, I can make those jokes because they know that that's all I do. But they've been awesome. They've been wonderful. Again, I can't thank them enough for how much they've supported me throughout my entire life and probably will still support me for a lot longer. You didn't see that? Saving the most important for last. Um, but before I get to that one really quickly, my girlfriend too, Courtney, she's been awesome. She's stuck with me throughout this entire time. She has put up with even probably more nonsense than Felipe have. But really the biggest importance, biggest acknowledgement is my dog, Winston. He has been the little light of my life, the little bundle of joy. I wasn't a dog person before we got him. And sometimes I like to say I'm just a Winston person, not necessarily a dog person. He's been, um, you know, super fun, super wonderful. He's helped me write my dissertation. He's listened to me talk through like ideas. We've gone on wonderful walks together. 
So with that, that's all I have to say. Um, thank you everyone for showing up. And if there's any questions, please ask. I don't I don't know with the, the delay how much time we have for questions. I, yeah, I just drew on them. No, there's a, there's a statistical package. It's called JTK cycle. It looks at a null kind of sine wave model and compares your gene expression to that. And if it fits the waveform model, it says, yeah, you have good evidence that this is rhythmic or if it doesn't, then it's not rhythmic. If you want, I can share that PDF with you somewhere. There's three hands, we'll go with Lindsay first. So, so when I say 95 shared, I mean, they have the same genes. It's just which genes were detected as being rhythmic. So, so they all have the same genes. Yeah, these aren't human versus banana copepods. It was just 95 of those 15,000 genes that they both share were both found to be rhythmic. Yeah, so that's actually, for a lot of people, that's kind of opposite of what you expect is when you have a shorter day, you typically have a shorter growth period, so you would typically not grow fast. Um, it's really speculation at this point, but one of the things that I think was convincing from at least other forms of literature is sometimes this is like a wintering response. So some species in short photo periods that associate with very cold weather can undergo diapause or hibernation to just kind of outlast the unfavorable conditions. For our copepods, which don't do that, you kind of need to make sure you get to that next generation, have your offspring, do that fun biological mandate. This could be a response to, instead of investing in your own growth, be a get to adulthood so I can get to reproductive age, so I can get a new generation out, so I don't have to worry about the wintering conditions. So that, that's at least one hypothesis that I think is a, it's an interesting one that would be really cool to explore further. But other than that, that's kind of where we're at. So we have gone back to those same sites and resampled copepods from those same pools that are still genetically similar to each other. It's not like I grabbed 300 copepods from Oregon, 300 from California, and that became three chapters. We grab them from these different areas and then we do keep them in laboratory conditions and raise them under these stock conditions. So you have copepods that are they have gone past any of the field collection kind of stressors that have happened and they have just become these populations that we've cultured and maintained in stock conditions. So just for the sake of clarity, I'll try to answer questions and then I may have to re-ask what you asked. Um, 
in their in their generalized stock conditions they are just kept at a 12 hour photo period at 20 degrees celsius consistently and then when we do the experimental designs for switching them what we end up doing is taking groups of like gravid females that have eggs take those eggs from them put them in a new incubator that is now under that new condition and raise them under that photo period for multiple generations so they're at least accustomed to that one and it's not like we're looking at the initial switch of them is that is that what the question was it's hard to remember the questions So yeah, that's a really great question. And I, you know, we're at that stage, at least for our system, where so little is known that like everything that is known about copepod circadian rhythms is basically what I've just presented to you. And then like two other papers. Um, I, I think that there could be something really interesting in terms of like how coordinated those responses are. So, you know, if there is no variation, they maybe have like, okay, this photo period cues for a very specific behavior that we need to be in tune to, to maximize fitness for whatever we're living in. Whereas the California population maybe has a lot more relaxed kind of constraints. And they're like, well, if I grow a few days later or whatever, it doesn't matter. The conditions that I live in are good enough that I'm fine either way. So I think there could be something really interesting there that um, if Felipe wants another grad student that wants to do not his normal work in copepods, maybe he can find that. <laughs> cool. Awesome.